And uh, verse, we're going to start in verse number 19. We're going to focus on verse 24 and 25. If you've been around church very long, you've probably heard a message from Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And, uh, but we're going to look a little bit at the context before that and to help us understand how this all fits into what we've been studying in the weeks prior. Hebrews chapter number 10, look with me there at verse number 19. The Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray one more time. And let's ask the Lord now as we enter this time of studying his word that he'll speak to us. And I hope that you'll pray with me that God would prepare your heart now, that God would find a, a soil that is soft, that he can plant the seeds of his word, and that you'll respond in faith uh, to what we study this morning. Father, thank you for your goodness. Father, I pray that, Lord, our desire would be exactly what we sang about here a moment ago, that you'd purify our hearts. Father, you'd cleanse us. God, that you'd prepare us to do your will. May that be our desire, Lord, that we would say, Lord, here am I, use me, that we would surrender ourselves as living sacrifices, and that now as we study your word, that our hearts would be open to whatever it is that you want to do, Lord, that we would uh, be like the wise man that plant, planted his house upon the rock, that heard your sayings and did them. And I pray that as we study your word this morning, God, I pray that you would have free reign to speak to us and that we would humbly respond, and God, that we would want to do your will. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week's message, if you missed it, is a, an important passage of Scripture for us to understand going into this week's message. And if you weren't able to be here last week, I'd encourage you to make a point of maybe going back. It is a longer message, but it's important in building the foundation. Uh, we talked there about the new covenant and what that, uh, what that means, uh, what the importance of it is for a New Testament believer. And uh, like I said, when we go into this passage of Scripture, uh, I, I have preached personally from Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. Most of you, again, have probably heard a message from Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. But when you look at the portion that we read from verse 19 down to verse 25, in the Greek New Testament, in, in, that is one particular sentence. 24 and 25 is not separated from the rest. That is all one complete sentence in the Greek, all six verses. And what that means is that they are tied together. We must consider the context of Hebrews, and we've spent a bulk of time there uh, considering exactly all these things, how they fit together and what the context is as we come into chapter number 10. And, uh, and there's three admonitions that we find in our passage of Scripture that are uh, spiritual charges. Uh, that's what it is that we're to obey doing. The writer of Hebrews helps us somewhat because oftentimes is in, in the book of Hebrews, excuse me, I'm stuttering a little bit. Um, the, the writer of Hebrews oftentimes begins a admonition with this phrase, let us. That's our cue to know, okay, here's what he's telling us what it is that we're to do. Uh, there's all of this information, there's this instruction that's been given, and then there's, here's what we're supposed to do that is based on that instruction. Here's the admonition. That's why the previous lessons all matter. That's why the, the whole uh, long time we took last week talking about the covenants and how the new covenant replaces the Mosaic covenant and all of that may seem like it's just head knowledge, but all of that matters when we come into this understanding of what it is we're supposed to do. How many of you like to receive some type of command? You're told to do something, but you don't understand the why in which you're supposed to do it. Most of us would say, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. We have a hard time doing or obeying a command when we don't understand the purpose of it. If I were to say to you halfway through the message this morning, I want everyone to get up and calmly walk through the back door and leave, you'd probably go, what in the world? Why, why would I do that? What, what are you talking about? If I say, okay, the church is on fire. Now, would you please get up and would you leave? The, we'd all understand it'd be a lot easier to obey understanding that information, the church is on fire. Well, it's important that we understand the why 
of, of what it is that we're supposed to do. And, and as we get into the later chapters here in the book of Hebrews, the writer is going to get far more practical and he's going to get far more clear in what it is that we are supposed to do. And all of that is built upon this information, this instruction that has already been established. The three charges that we read here in chapter number 10, they all flow from this reality, this heavenly reality that we've understood that Jesus is the great high priest, that that is his role, that is his uh, uh, place in, in terms of our relationship to him, that it is through this great high priest, Jesus, that we can participate in the new covenant. That's what we talked about last week. This is a divine relationship that is established between you and God. The purpose of that covenant is so that God would have a special people, so that those people would serve God. The reality of this is what leads us into this practical aspect of life. That is that rea the reality of that relationship that dictates the why and the what that we are to do in life. And I tried to illustrate that for those that were here last week with, uh, I brought Grace and I brought Adeline and I explained that Grace is my child and that relationship aspect means that I give different instruction, different expectations for her than I would maybe Adeline who's not part of my household, who's not a member of my family. And so when we talk about the what that we are to do, it flows from this divine relationship that we enter into at salvation. Uh, the new covenant gives us the promise of forgiveness of sins, but there are also expectations for its participants. We are to adopt certain behavior in thinking along with it. Now, if this, if this is added to salvation, if this becomes part of how we uh, become a child of God, then that's what's called legalism, and that's not what we're talking about. But when it comes and flows from the understanding of our identity in Christ then it is what we call sanctification. It is me living like a faithful child of the new covenant, not trying to become part of the new covenant. And getting into these last chapters, more of that will come clear of what it looks like to be a child of God and what it looks like to live uh, under this new covenant that we participate in. Like the entire New Testament, it serves as an instruction manual of how to live as a participant in this new covenant that God has established, a new and better covenant. That's what chapters 8 and chapters 9 talk about. Now, when we talk about how to act like a child of God or how to be faithful as the people of God, we must understand our identity and our union together with Christ. It is vital to maintaining the right perspective toward Christian obligations and personal transformation. If we've been saved, if we've been regenerated, if we've been, we no longer live then under the chain of sin, we've been freed from the bondage of sin. We've been given a new nature that wants to reign in our lives and then transform us from the inside out. If you refuse then to be transformed, if you resist to live and walk in this new light of being a child of God, of being in union with Christ, then does that mean that you'll lose it? Does that mean that, that salvation will disappear? No. It could mean that you never had it to begin with. And uh, we'll elaborate more on that next week in Hebrews chapter number 12. But many never fully understand what it means to be in Christ. They never experienced the full power available to the Christian to the extent of the holy life that Christ wants to produce in them. Remember back in chapter number five, we had this discussion about babes who uh, could only receive the milk of the word and they couldn't receive the meat of the word. They, they weren't growing in their maturity. They were never progressing past this spiritual infancy. And the reason is, is they were never grounded and this identity in Christ, they didn't, there's not this understanding of the full ramifications of what it means to be in Christ. In my mind, this is why many professing Christians don't actually live in accordance with the New Testament. They don't know exactly what it means and fully entails to be a Christian. And the writer of Hebrews has tried to give us this foundation so that we can build on top of it, so that we can go on unto maturity. 
And, and, and so that we can build on top of that. That's the beginning of chapter number seven that we looked at. And here in chapter number 10, it all comes full circle. Look with me again in verse number 19. He says there, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. The writer here repeats what he began really at the beginning of this section in Hebrews. You remember back in chapter number four, we talked about uh, the throne of grace. And uh, we talked about how we were to come boldly unto him. The same uh, admonitions that we saw there in chapter number four, the same admonitions he repeats here. What is the child of God? What is the Christian? What is the one who has been regenerated to do? Well, first, they are to come boldly to the throne of God. We are to depend on this access that has been granted to us to come to the throne of God and get mercy and get grace and get the help we need for whatever it is that we're facing. That's the first admonition. We have a union with Christ which guarantees us this access to the throne and provides them whatever is needed to live the godly life. So let us come boldly. Let us uh, come and depend upon this throne of God. The second admonition is what keeps us from wavering. It's being grounded in our identity in Christ. Our confidence comes from uh, that as a believer. I, got, I think I got ahead of myself. It should be there in your notes. But look with me in Hebrews chapter number four at the parallel here of how the writer began this section and now he repeats the same thing. He says, seeing then, you have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What does it mean to be the people of God? It means that through Jesus, we have this constant access and therefore we are to come boldly. We're to approach him. Nothing is bigger than our God and we have him and he has us. We should depend on him and we should trust him. One, one major area that discourages lost people from uh, wanting salvation is when Christians say that they trust God, but then things get difficult and they don't show any faith at all. That's the kind of story that Hebrews chapter number 11 writes. It gives us a person after person who faced challenges, that faced persecution, that faced difficulties, but their faith showed out. Uh, they, they were trusting in the Lord. If you actually serve a God that is greater than all, then shouldn't your faith back that up? There is a list of those there in that passage of Scripture who serve as examples of what it looks like to be a child of God who lives by faith. We draw near to God based on Jesus being our high priest. This covenant relationship of having our sins forgiven, of being regenerated, of having a union with Christ is what keeps us then from wavering. It's what keeps us confident in the Christian life. Being grounded in that identity in Christ. Understanding who he is and what he does for us. That, that, that's what keeps us confident. Back in chapter number three, verse number six, we studied this weeks ago. It says there, Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. We're to hold fast this confidence. Why? Because we have Christ and he has us. Hebrews 3 and verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So where does confidence in the Christian life come from? It comes from understanding who we are in Christ and what Christ is for us. Look with me here at the end of verse number 23. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised the verse reminds us there that the one who has promised us, the one who has given all of these things is faithful. We don't have to waver because the promises are sure. They're an anchor for our soul. We looked at in Hebrews chapter number six. There is also a practical side to this. If our God is faithful, if he always keeps his promises, if he doesn't uh, depart from us, shouldn't then we be faithful to him? 
Shouldn't we act as if we are in a covenant with him that requires our allegiance? The idea of this covenant relationship is most closely understood in our concept of marriage. That's why Ephesians 5 tells us that we are the bride of Christ. He's the groom. We're the bride. We are married to him. We, we have entered into <clears throat> excuse me, this, this covenant. If I were leaving the church this morning and you kind of overheard me having a conversation with my wife and my wife says to me, okay, so I'll see you at home pretty soon. And I said, no, you know what? I think I'm going to go out and I'm going to look for women. I know that's kind of crude, but it, it work, work with me here. You'd probably be like, what in, what in the world is pastor thinking? He, he's married. He can't do that. He, he, he can't go out looking for other women. He's, he made a vow. And, and Miss Mandy and the kids at home, how could he do that to them? And, and surely they're going to be impacted by his foolish decisions to go and, and look for other women. We'd, you'd probably say, look, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Why? Because I'm in a covenant. I stood 12 years ago, sorry, got to do the math, 12 years ago at an altar and I made a vow and I, that I would forsake all others and that she would be my wife, what, till death do us part. And this idea of marriage kind of helps us mostly understand what it means to be in a covenant. My unfaithfulness in that covenant surely impacts my wife and my children. That vow has been made. Now listen, if you are truly saved and you have been covenanted together with God, when you are unfaithful, it impacts your Savior and his other children as well. If you think you can sin and be unfaithful and it doesn't matter because all of your sins are forgiven, then friend, you're mistaken. If you have been born again, your life is no longer just yours. You are one with Christ. What you say, what you do, where you go, he goes with you. You are one with him. Now, all of this is a long and it's an important introduction because it gives us, helps us understand the magnitude of the words that are about to be given to us. It sets the stage for the rest of the passage. Do we understand, okay, all of the foundation, and again, if you missed last week, it's vitally important because if we are saved, if we've been born again, then yes, our sins are forgiven, but that's only a part of what it means to participate in the new covenant. The whole purpose of that is that we would be God's and he would, he would be our God, that we would follow him, that we'd be his servants, that we'd be loyal to him, that we would be in a covenant relationship with him. After all this teaching of the great, about the great high priest and participants in a new and better covenant and all that that entails, that we are, <clears throat> excuse me, God's people. And he is our God. He repeats this charge to hold fast our confession without wavering. Hey, be faithful. Draw strength from God and continue on. Don't waver in your faith. The next practical instruction about living as a child of God then has to do with the assembling together of God's people. That's not accidental. That is strategic. Here is what I believe as, is absolutely the reality from my experience as a Christian. When we waver in our confidence and our commitment to the Lord, often the first thing that is lost is being faithful to church. That's the first thing that goes. It is one service, and then it's another, and then all of a sudden we haven't been in a while. And I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor. I'm saying because clearly... God is saying it, that as a child of God, as a member of God's household, those that have received Christ, it, it must then make a priority to assemble with the body of Christ. I want to ask you this question as we get going into the main message here. What does going to church mean to you? What does it mean to you? It means different things to different people. And the question is, is today, will you allow God to shape what church should look like in your life? Are you willing to take your perspective of what church should be and kind of put it aside and say, God, will you teach me what church should be in my life? And in our passage of scripture, as we look at verse 24 and verse 25, there's really three elements that should be a part of every church gathering. There's three elements of when the church comes together, not just in a sense to say, okay, it's a service, but when the church comes together to signify what God intends for it to signify, 
then there's three elements that we can identify here in our passage of scripture. If you're following there in your notes, notice with me the first element is this, to consider one another. I apologize, I forgot to bring my iPad up here so I could change the points, but I'll try to make it clear where the points are, okay? Uh, The first point here, the first element is that we are to consider one another. Look again at verse 24. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We have to acknowledge that there is a vast difference in the average person's concept of church and the perspective that God wants us to have. We are in a consumer-driven society and this mentality has so permeated the church that it is hard to see it another way. A lot of churchgoers, while they won't admit it, believe that church, church exists as an institution primarily to meet the needs of people. Through the programs offered and through the teaching, it is something that should be attractive so that people will want to come. Generally speaking, people come to church because they or their family believe it is good for them to be here. That's not wrong. I hope that you feel like it's a benefit for you to be at church. And I'm not arguing that that's not the case. However, that misses the point. And in a sense, that gives you an excuse when you don't feel like it's good for you to be here. Or when you don't feel like being here. Ultimately, coming to church shouldn't be for or about us. We should be thinking of others. The word here, consider, that is used, that we are to consider one another, means to consider attentively, to fix one's eyes or mind upon. When we come to a church meeting, we should be focused on and thinking about others. I think we all need and want to be encouraged, right? I think all of us would say it would be a blessing to be encouraged and to have someone to encourage me uh, when we come together or maybe someone to send a text or pick up a phone call. But definitely when we come to church, maybe someone would say hello and say, hey, it's good to see you. Or, hey, we've missed you. Hey, what's going on in your life? How are you and your family doing? We would all say, you know, it's nice when someone encourages us. When someone is not just sitting in their seat and staring at Facebook or playing a video or a game on their phone until the service starts, but someone would take the initiative and consider us. The question is, how many of us have prayed that we can be an encouragement to someone else today? We need to break this mold of thinking that life is for and about me and put our eyes on others. When we are making that decision maybe to come to church or not to come to church. When we decide to stay home because we don't feel like going. We are solidifying that perception that it's about me. When we get dressed and we go not for ourselves but for others, we are finally assuming the real intention of the church. Considering others doesn't mean that I'm to fix my eyes on others with a critical eye that I'm to be evaluating everyone so that I can correct them or I can go home and gossip with my spouse about them, okay? That's not the idea of considering one another. Maybe taking a little notes and say, okay, I, I saw you do this the other day at church and I want to talk. That's not the idea. We're not looking with this critical eye so that we can tear others down. We're looking with the eye that's looking for those that have needs, those, uh, looking for ways that we could be a blessing to others, I was thinking about that passage of Jesus when he got the 12 disciples from the context we understand that not long before that, they were debating about who would be the greatest. And Jesus took them up into the upper room there for the final supper. And he sat each of them down and then Jesus began to wash their feet. The creator of the universe, the master, got on his hands and knees and and cleaned their dirty feet. And then he says to them, This thing that I've done to you, you should do to one another. He wanted them to understand of what it means in terms of church is that we are to serve others. We're to do things for other people, not for ourselves. When we come together, we should have an attitude to serve. Our presence should be felt. Can I ask you, is the singing volume louder because you're here? 
Is the spirit warmer and friendlier because you're here? Is the offering for the Lord greater because you're here? Now, I understand a lot of people give online now. I could go on, but does you being here make a difference or are you just a consumer? Do you just receive but not give at all? 59 times in the New Testament, we see this phrase, one another. We are to be servants and others are to be the recipients. When uh, this whole COVID thing started, I was having a conversation with my, with my brother. Now, we didn't live stream our services before that. Uh, we had them on a podcast, but we started live streaming. And uh, that caught some people to get attention. My brother, he lives over in Arkansas. Uh, they're several hours behind us. And so uh, he started to listen to some of the, the messages. And I was having a conversation with him <clears throat> early in the week. And he was talking about how on Sunday... He was out with his son. They were fishing on the lake, but he was listening to the message live here uh, while I was preaching. And he said, yeah, we had that thing blasted. The whole lake could hear us, uh, hear you preaching and while we were out there fishing. And I was like, you know, that's cool. Praise the Lord for technology. And I'm glad that, you know, he's receiving the biblical content. But understand that that is not doing church. There is no way to do something for one another while you're just hearing the content. I have a pastor friend who said it this way. If you can miss church and not be missed, then something is not right. If you can miss church and not miss it, then something is not right. Let me say that again so that we get it. If you can miss church and not be missed, then something is not right. If you can miss church and not miss it, then something is not right. We're to consider one another. And then it says to provoke unto love and good works. Now, two things that cannot be accomplished in solitude but require recipients is good works and love. You can't, and I do suppose people love themselves, obviously, but in reality, to really fulfill the commandments to love, it requires another person. Uh, to do good works, you don't do good works for yourselves. You must do good works for others. Those are things that require us to be around other people. And this word provoke, it's the idea of incitement or stimulation. We tend to think about provoking in a negative way. Uh, when someone provokes us, oftentimes it's kind of to anger. I remember one of my kids, I don't know which one, used to have a toy. I think it was uh, Raphael, the Ninja Turtle. And he would say this, don't make me angry. And you know, you'd hear that all day. Don't make me angry. Don't, uh, don't provoke me. Don't incite me to anger. And oftentimes we think about that in a negative context. This idea of provoking, you, you can only do that when you're around other people. Those of you with multiple children understand that. You put three kids in the back seat of the car and there will be provoking. He touched me. He looked at me. He smells funny. He won't close his mouth while he's chewing, right? I mean, we've heard it all. But you take one kid with you, something magical happens. There's no fighting, right? You can only provoke others when you're around others. You can't provoke and you can't be provoked in solitude. And this idea of provoking, we are to provoke one another to love and to good works. Uh, two things that we are, can only do with others. We are to provoke others when we lovingly serve them. It provokes us when someone does something Un, uh, kind to us when somebody does something that was really unmerited, but they go out of their way and they seek to be a blessing. And what do we do? We don't go, well, I can't believe they did that. That wasn't very nice. No, we say, well, that was a blessing. And then we think, well, who can I be a blessing to? It provokes us to say, boy, maybe I ought to think about someone else and who I can be a blessing to. Uh, this idea of passing it on. Oftentimes we get blessed and then we pass that blessing on to another. So we see this, consider one another. The first element of assembling together God's way is that we are to consider one another. You know what makes a church a, a, a great church? When the majority of the people are busy and excited to do something for others. When people are, hey, what can I do to be a blessing? And it's kind of like a beehive of people serving one another, encouraging one another, uh, giving life to one another. That, that's a good church. When everyone is just concerned about themselves and they sit quietly or they don't ever reach out to someone, they don't say an encouraging word, 
That's how the Spirit of Christ dies in a church. So we're to consider one another. And then notice with me, secondly, the second element is that we are to come together. We consider one another and we come together. Look with me at verse 25. It says, They're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The word church in the New Testament is the Greek word ekklesia. It means a called out assembly. It is the nature of a church to assemble. It is the church's most fundamental task to come together. You can't fulfill all of the one another passages if you don't have time together, if you don't come together. There were some at at the time of the writing of Hebrews who had already forsaken this coming together. The word assemble here is the word, the Greek word epi synagogue. That, that word synagogue comes from that word. It means a gathering together in one place. The focus is not on the specific location or building, but on the people that gather together. The location can be anywhere. What makes church, what makes it church is when the body of believers that make up the local body are present. The question is then when and how often should the church come together? Does the Bible give instruction on that? Well, actually it does. And one thing we can take away, the early church set a clear example for us about when they assembled. They met on the first day of the week. In the Jewish tradition, they would meet on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a holy day. It was a special day. There was to be no work done, and uh, there was a limit to maybe what activities you could do. It would be culminated at the end of the day with a trip to the synagogue to gather together and hear the word of God and worship the Lord. When Jesus resurrected and uh, and, and ascended back into heaven, that, that all changed. The The church, the early church, they gathered together, according to the book of Acts, not on the Sabbath, but on the first day of the week, on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. In the decades after Jesus' resurrection, Sunday became known as the Lord's Day. It was His day. Uh, The church uh, assembled on that day. 1 Corinthians 16 says that uh, Paul instructed the church to bring their offerings on that particular day, on the first day of the week. The clear and obvious teaching is that the church assembles on Sunday. However, that was not the only time that they gathered together. Acts chapter number 2 says that they met daily in the temple and they broke bread. Also, it says that people were added to the church daily. There was this constant outreach and baptism going on. The whole church might not have have assembled, but some people got together and encouraged one another and prayed together. There were special prayer meetings that were beyond Sunday. There were times when the Lord's Supper would be administered. There was maybe times when a special preacher came into town and they would have a special gathering time to hear the teaching of God's word. Acts records an account where Paul was in Troas and they had a church meeting. That church meeting, it says, lasted until midnight when a young man, Eutychus, fell out the window because he fell asleep. This was at midnight. Paul, he was, you think I preached long. Paul was going till midnight. And Eutychus falls out of the window from the upper room where they were having church. The point I'm trying to make is that coming, the, the coming together of the church absolutely happened regularly on the first day of the week. But that was not the extent of it. The work of the church went on every day of the week. For those with this mindset, I attend when it is convenient for me or when I feel like it, if it fits my schedule, you're missing the priority that God places on his people coming together. In the case of those mentioned that were forsaking the assembly, it was likely due to persecution. Those that attended the gathering of Christian believers were likely noted and action was taken against them. Not wanting to face this backlash, some decided that they were already saved, their sins were forgiven, and it wasn't worth it, or it wasn't a big deal to then go and meet with the other believers, so they stopped. Now, I would say if the possibility of bodily harm, of imprisonment, or economic damage was not a good enough excuse for people to miss church, then the silly, 
sorry, selfish reasons that are often used today aren't acceptable either. I've heard a boatload of them in my time. It's amazing how diligent people can be to their careers, to their exercise routine, to their favorite sports team, but not to the assembling together of God's people. During this coronavirus pandemic, it has definitely been a challenge to the gathering together of God's people. I, like many of you, was frustrated when some businesses, including uh, pot shops and liquor stores, were deemed essential and church gatherings were considered not essential. But can I just take a moment? It, I don't feel like I've been venting. I'm, I'm going to vent here for a moment, okay? The rest of it, that was not me venting. That was me just giving it. I'm more disappointed in the church members that were all worked up about that, about church not being essential, that since that time have been not more faithful to church, but less. You cast your vote whether you think church is essential every Sunday morning at 11, every Wednesday night at 7, every monthly men's meeting, every special revival meeting. You cast your vote whether you think church is essential or not. Some said a long time ago that you don't believe church is essential by putting a multitude of things in front of it. Okay, vent's over, all right? Notice what it says here in verse 25 where it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we draw closer to the return of Christ, we are to be more committed to gathering together, not less. The word assemble here is found one other, in one other passage in the word of God, and that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. This word episynagoge is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Notice with me there in your notes. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. This is, a, this is prophetic of the future moment when all that are in Christ, dead and alive, are gathered together to meet, the, to meet Christ in the air. The bride will be unified with the groom. People from every tribe, nation, and tongue will gather around the Lamb of God in His throne and will worship Him. In a sense, every time the, the church comes together and meets together, it is a dress rehearsal for this future gathering that will take place. Now, nothing we do on earth will compare to what will take place in heaven to worship, to exalt, to glorify the Savior. But our purpose is still the same. Every time we meet together that you are present, you are solidifying in your heart and mind the reality of our future destiny as a believer in Christ. Why does the devil work so hard for, to keep Christians from gathering together? Because he wants to keep your eyes focused on the now. He wants uh, the things of this world, the problems and pleasures of the present time to be your focus. That is why we need to be God's people practicing for heaven. As the world, or as the world according to prophecy, grows worse and worse, as truth is diminished and the masses believe a lie, as persecution intensifies... Uh, those that name the name of Christ, we must stick together. We must encourage one another. We must strengthen one another and be faithful. I was reading an interesting article about fire ants and how they could float. They would come together and float. For years, scientists were baffled by the mystery of these floating fire ants. When placed in water, an individual ant would, would flounder, struggle, and then eventually sink. But when the fire ants banded together, they formed life rafts that helped them survive the flash floods of the Brazilian rainforest. As a unified raft, they can travel for months before reaching dry land. An article in the Los Angeles Times summarized a new research study that has unlocked the secret of this natural mystery. After collecting a bunch of ants, scientists dropped them in a, into containers of water. The ants quickly spread out and formed themselves into rafts. Each individual ant used its claws and the adhesive pads on their legs to grip onto each other. One researcher said, at first it just looks like a tangle of bodies and limbs everywhere. 
But the longer you look at the picture, the more you're able to distinguish between different body parts and see the connection. Then the insects use their air pockets that form around their bodies to keep themselves afloat. The article concluded, the research shed, sheds light on how deeply social insects act together, almost as if they are part of a superorganism. One scientist said the individuals acting together create this awareness of the environment that no individual ant has. That is the picture, that is the idea of what God wants for his body, his church, that it would be different members who are eachly unique, but they would be banded together, that they would crisscross and they would be unified as one organism and that together they could survive anything, that together they could go much farther. Together, whatever storms of life came, they could ride them out together. The New Testament often clearly speaks of our need to be connected to fellow believers in order to survive and to grow spiritually. Alone, we can sink, but clinging and growing together in Christ, we can ride out whatever comes our way. We're to consider one another. We're to come together. And then look with me thirdly, we're to do this. We're to coach one another. In verse 25, it talks about this idea of exhorting one another. We find another one of these one another instructions. We probably need some help understanding what it means to exhort one another. That's not a popular word in our vocabulary. If we are to obey it, then we must understand it. Exhortation is defined as an urging done by, is an urging done by someone close beside. It comes from this Greek word paraklete. A periclesis, which means to call to one side, to summon, to encourage, to admonish, or to entreat. To, to exhort is to then develop a relationship with other believers for the purpose of encouraging them in their spiritual growth. I like to think of the idea of exhortation as coaching because it, come, it combines this idea of instruction and encouragement. Sometimes people want to be encouraged, but they don't want to hear instruction other times uh, we, we need instruction, but if we don't have the encouragement, then we won't want to obey it. And it's the idea of instruction and encouragement. And uh, th when I think of that, I think of a good coach. A good coach doesn't just teach you from afar. Uh, in the competition, the coach is there urging you on, yelling, encouraging you. I, I remember when I would be running my cross country or my track meets, I can, I can specifically remember my coach's voice. He'd be right on the track and he'd be saying, come on, Tim, you got to get two, you got to get three. He'd tell me how many people I needed to pass or he'd, he'd yell out my time and say, you got to pick up this. And he was urging me. He was giving instruction, but he was encouraging me. And I think of, uh, many of you have maybe done some other sports, whether it be a football coach that's yelling, hey, get, get in your place, or uh, maybe a wrestling coach that's saying, do this move, and he's on the mat, and he's pounding on the mat, and he's saying, do this move, and they're, they're trying to coach you. They're trying to tell you what to do, but they're for you, and they're trying to urge you on. That's the idea of exhortation. Part of Timothy's job as a young pastor was to encourage and admonish those within his flock. Obviously, the work of pastoring requires exhortation, coming alongside someone and sharing scripture with them and encouraging them to be faithful to God. Romans 12 talks about exhortation being a spiritual gift. There are those who have special grace and are therefore able to uh, do this exhortation more successfully. Why? Because God has given them the grace to do so. But notice that the command here to exhort one another isn't just for those who are pastors. It isn't just for those who have the spiritual gift. It is a work that we are all called to do. Not just the pastor, those who, who have that gifting of God. We are to exhort one another. Hebrews chapter number three and verse 13, we kind of skipped over this verse before when we studied that, but it says there, but exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This idea of exhorting one another isn't even just supposed to happen Sunday morning at 11. It's to happen daily. We're to do this work of being the body of Christ and fulfilling that role of encouraging one another on a daily basis. A healthy church is one where exhortation is received and practiced. In our pride, we don't always want to hear exhortation. I remember one time I was, my 
when I was in the Air Force, we, I was in a church that had a men's prayer meeting every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Why they chose 7 a.m., I don't know, but I was there faithfully at 7 a.m. every Sunday morning. And uh, we would pray, and then we'd go get some breakfast and then come back for the service. And, uh, and there was this one brother. He was not my favorite brother, to be honest with you, but he was also faithful to the prayer meeting. I remember one Sunday, we were headed to the restaurant where we were going to eat. It was just me and him. And he began to talk to me about, about praying. And he, he was talking to me about how often I said, Lord. I said, Lord, do this. Lord, do this. Lord. And he wasn't wrong. I was still growing in my faith. I'd only been saved a few years. My prayer life definitely needed to grow. But to be honest with you, when he started talking about my prayers, I, I got mad. I was like, look, I'm not praying for you, pal, right? I'm praying to the Lord. If you don't like it, go find someone else to pray with then. And, it, it, and my immediate response wasn't, oh, thank you for trying to teach me about prayer, right? In my pride, I didn't want to hear the instruction. Our pride doesn't like necessarily exhortation. Sometimes when someone comes alongside and they're rightfully meeting, the problem is us and we just don't want anybody to tell us anything. A healthy church will receive exhortation, but then also here's the thing, in our insecurity, we don't always like to give exhortation. We don't want to be the one when we see a brother or a sister over there that seems to be, we, we'd prefer it to be someone else to maybe go and kind of minister kind of deal with them in their challenges that they're facing. But the fact is, is that exhortation requires us to consider others and be willing to reach out, to come alongside them. This probably is not convenient. It's not going to fit our schedule easily. We would all much rather sit back and let someone encourage us. But a healthy church, this is the hard work that has to happen for a church to be what God wants it to be, not what you necessarily want it to be. With a new year right now, it's January 3rd, and obviously every new year, lots of people make uh, New Year's resolutions. And uh, most of the time, those resolutions, they failed them by the end of January. And uh, one of the major reasons that people often fail with their resolutions is because they are doing them alone. Research backs this up, that many fall short of their goals. And uh, in, in, in trying to address this, in his book, Who's Got Your Back?, author Keith Ferrazzi says it's because we often go alone when trying to make changes. And he, in his book, considers the story of Jean Nidich, who was overweight as a child. She was overweight in high school, and despite endless diet regimens, her waistline kept expanding throughout her 20s and 30s. She fit the medical definition of obese. Jean tried diets and pills that promised to take off the pounds, but she always gained the weight back that she lost. In 1961, at age 38, Jean started a diet sponsored by the New York City Department of Health. After 10 weeks, she was 10 pounds lighter, but started to lose motivation. She realized that she needed someone to talk to for some support. Since she couldn't get her pals to make the trek with her to Manhattan to sign up for the official health department regimen, she brought the science of the program to their living rooms in Queens. Jean and her friends would all lose weight together. Out of those first meetings grew what is now known as Weight Watchers, widely recognized as one of the most effective weight loss programs in the world. Nidich's idea was simple. Losing weight requires a combination of dieting and peer support. She held weekly meetings with weight check-ins and, and goal setting to promote accountability coupled with honest, supportive conversation about the struggles, setbacks, and victories over losing weight. Evidently, Nidich, who lost 72 pounds, um, rented office space and started leading groups all over New York City. In 1963, she incorporated. As of 2007, Weight Watchers International had retail sales over $4 billion. Here's the main idea. Here's what the company's current CEO, David Kirchhoff, notes. He says, though the science of weight loss has evolved over the years, the core of Gene's program, support and accountability has remained constant. The church that can receive and give exhortation, that is willing to be accountable to, our, to my brothers and sisters who will be honest, who will uh, explain when they're struggling, that will ask for prayer, that will be willing to step out of a comfort zone and go to someone that they can see is having a hard time and try to encourage them, to try to motivate them, to try to show some support for them. The church that will do that will thrive. 
I think we'd all admit that there are times where we could use someone to come alongside us, to encourage us, to just say, hey, I know it's hard, but keep on going. Be faithful. Stick with it. But are you willing to be the person that does that? That puts your hurt, pains, heartache aside and considers someone else who may be going through difficult times. If a church is filled with people who understand and desire to exhort one another, it will be a lively, it will be an encouraging place to be. If everyone sits around waiting for someone else to do it, then the spirit of Christ and what he wants to do in his body dies. Several years ago, they, uh, the Geico Insurance Company began a series of commercials, many of you have probably heard them, that end with this slogan, it's what you do. The full, sl- the full slogan is, if you want to save 15% on car insurance, then switch to Geico, it's what you do. One of my favorite of those commercials shows a man who's in the desert, and uh, he's kind of running from someone, and he gets in the desert, and he gets caught in quicksand. And he's looking around frantically for some help with the quicksand, and there he sees this fluffy cat. And he says to the cat, he says, go get help, boy. Go get help. Go right now. And the cat just stares at him. And then it says this, if you're a cat, you ignore people. It's what you do. We have looked at some deep and important theological concepts over the past several weeks. They are intended to ground us in our understanding of Christ as our great high priest. That through him, we are participants of the new covenant. That means that we have a covenant relationship. We are God's people. He is our God. If we are saved, then we are his children. We are his people. This means that when there is a gathering for God's people at the local church, you go. It's not just a, and not just as a spectator, but as a participant that considers and coaches others. It's what you do. In my house, mom pretty much always makes dinner. Uh, I very rarely do that. But when mom says dinner's ready, that means it's time for everyone in the house to gather around the island and we pray. It's not all that uncommon that two of my children look at what's for dinner and don't want to participate. But as members of the family, they will sit on their stool and they will pray. They are members of, and it's what you do at dinner time. When mom says, dinner's ready, you don't do something else. No, you come together and you pray with the family. You may not touch your food, but you're going to at least come and pray and you're going to sit there with a bad attitude. I asked you at the beginning, would you allow God to shape what church should be in your life? God has spoken. He said, if you're a child, if you're my child, when it's time to come together, I expect you there. It doesn't matter if you like everything. It doesn't matter if you approve of the songs that Pastor picks or what particularly he's preaching about. Or maybe you don't like a brother or sister over there. There's, that's a different message. But you go. It's what you do as a child of God. This morning, does your attitude need to change and come into alignment with what God's view of church is? Do you need to stop making excuses Do you need to start engaging more and participating rather than sitting on the sidelines? This isn't my own make church great again campaign, okay? This is what God says his instruction is for his children about doing church his way. First, we must consider one another. It's not about you. We must come together and we must coach one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word.